Village for this. I've got the cutting from the Abroth Herald that covered the opening in 1934. It said if there were any doubts about the public's enthusiasm in regard to the new bathing pool, these were entirely dispelled at the weekend when thousands passed through the turnstiles. Well, there they are, all their glory. And as we come round to the balcony, George, obviously in with the, the high hegens here, has got a very good vantage point looking right across the platform at the, the civic dignitaries, one of whom, of course, the Earl of Strathmore, who was performing the opening, was the father of the present Queen Mother. So there was quite a bit of interest aroused by his presence. One or two unrehearsed incidents as well, I gather. The Lord Provost of Dundee was uh, one of the guests and his Panama hat blew off into the new pool. <laughs> That's like a trophy almost. <laughs> and of course, uh, local swimmers having a race to inaugurate the new pool, I would imagine. There we go, and the diving competition. The, one of the Olympic swimmers, um, Ellen King, was present at this opening as well. Arbroath on the lovely Angus seaboard has been the sunniest place in Scotland for four years past the town council are determined to exploit to the full its potentialities as Scotland's leader. Invigorating breezes sweeping in from the North Sea give health and happiness to visitors as they wander through the beautiful rural scenery near the town or feast their eyes on the grandeur of the cliffs and caverns which guard this loveliest spot from the ravages of the sea. Expectant crowds are flocking to the opening of a new open-air swimming pool by the Earl of Strathmore and King Horn, the Lord Lieutenant of the county. The new bath is Scotland's largest filtered seawater swimming pool, and they are simply queuing up to bang sixpences for admission to the opening ceremony. The Earl of Strathmore arrives and is introduced to the audience by Provost Sir William Chapel. Then the Earl declares the pool open, and mannequins show the ladies just what to wear when they take the plunge, angle on the beach, or go for a cruise. This makes some of the younger men decide to become sailors. <laughs> diving platform built to Olympic specifications as a feature of the new pool. Another mannequin parade demonstrating the latest swimming costumes makes some of the men go off the deep end as they will be out of pocket by the time their wives have finished choosing their new costumes in honor of the new pool. That's mad. Number five. From Two. the co-op in the high street. Yes. I think all the mannequins were from the co-op in the high street. We were all rather jealous of them, I must say. <laughs> it's a great day. They don't look very warm when you look at them, do they? That looks like the, the bit where the, the heavens wind. open. Aye. But the crowd's leaving, are all smiling. Yes, yes. Very good natured. This film was made by a, a Gaumont news cameraman as a sort of freelance, a homer you'd call it now. Uh -huh. And he was asked to take lots of shots of close-ups of people of leaving. People so that when here. it was shown uh -huh. in the local cinema, you know, yes. they'd all be able to spot themselves. And why do you think it, it fell out of popularity, the Arbroath Pool? Well, I think it was the weather was against it, and uh, youngsters got more sophisticated, I suppose, and uh, a lot of them used to go up to the baths in Dundee, which were bigger than the Arbroath baths, although the baths indoor. were good. Indoor. Mm -hmm. Well, the crowds obviously enjoyed the opening. Were you one of the keen Arbroath swimmers in the 1930s, Alan? Yes. Were you? We actually went, <coughs> pardon me, went to the baths every morning, which were also salt water, at half past six in the morning. <laughs> For but many the, years. But the in open the air pool, the open air pool was notoriously cold, wasn't oh, it? Oh, it was freezing. But then it was summer, 
supposedly. <laughs> <laughs> but it was good. Once you, once you were in swimming, it was great. And once the novelty had worn off, did it continue as a, a big attraction in our growth for many years? Yes, till the war, really. And then it just faded. And what's yeah. happened to the place now? It's now Bally's nightclub. And are there plans for doing anything else with it? I Perhaps bringing know. it back to well, being a Well, I pool? don't know. There's still the pool, you see. The, the Bally's is in the front part of the building. And the but, pool's just uh, standing there, mm, derelict and full of memories. Which is rather sad. It is indeed. Rather Bernard, sad. in its day, a Broth swimming pool would have been one of many similar attractions. One of many similar attractions up the East Coast. But you've got to remember, Jerry, that sea swimming wasn't always popular. It really came about when one of the king's royal physicians announced that sea swimming was good for you. Uh, and therefore, people took up sea swimming. Uh, and about 100 years ago, the famous Captain Webb swam the channel, and then mm -hmm. people realized it was a macho sport, <laughs> and more and more men joined in. And in those days, bathing huts were dragged down to the sea by horses, uh, and you actually went into the sea, so it was very modest, and no one saw you. Uh, and costumes as well were very modest. They reached the knee, uh, reached the elbow, uh, and gradually, as you can see by that photograph, they changed quite a lot. Uh, they became backless, and then twin colours with a belt, and then eventually the daring devils of ladies would have a bare midriff. Uh, this, of course, led ultimately to the itsy bitsy, teeny weedy, yellow polka dot bikini <laughs> that we see today. <laughs> Well, coming up next, the uh, interval, or the intermission, as it's sometimes called, when at places like Aberdeen's Tivoli Theatre, you could join the crowds in the bar or buy a box of chocolates from the usherette with the tray. I'm going to be taking the tickets in a minute or two, but in the meantime, you can just catch a glimpse of the end of the first half with Alec Finlay bringing down the curtain. McTavish was fight major in the Highlands Cut Brigade and proudly led the regiment when it was on parade. He loved the bonny last day and before he went away, she sold a little keepsake so he'd think on her each day. It was the Tory on his bonny, the red Tory on it, the red Tory, Ori, Ori, he let his kilt and sparring, and off he went to war in his red to rio 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 And when swinging into action, he's the centre of attraction. He's the pride of Bonnie Scotland, so they say. to be there just when you need them. Hello, how can I help you? Pop into your local Currys this Christmas and you'll discover why we're different from everywhere else with perfect presents for even the choosiest people thanks to our great range, great names and great prices. Like this Sanyo Multiplay CD right. Hi-Fi on interest-free credit. Curries, you'll like the difference. Onto the stage of Aberdeen's Tivoli Theatre, this spotlight has shone down on legendary comedians from W.C. Fields to Will Fife on famous classical actors like Sir Henry Irving and Max Beerbohm Tree, on troops of performing circus elephants, and on the music hall greats from Florrie Ford to Frankie Vaughan. A very young Julie Andrews started her career on this stage, so too did Johnny Beatty. And this spotlight has picked them all out, the tops of the bills to the small bit players, the stars to the choruses, ever since this theater first opened in 1872. 
Nowadays, there are very few live shows from this stage, although people do still flock in twice nightly to play bingo. However, the whole place is just full of theatrical memories. For those who were members of its once packed audiences, for the people who tore their tickets in half and showed them to their seats, for the backstage crews and the musicians here in the orchestra pit, and of course, for those who appeared here on stage in the full glare of this spotlight. We're going to try to recapture a bit of the magic from those days with the help of Jenny Douglas, who met her future husband John here in the 1930s when she was an usherette and he was appearing on stage as one of the curbside three, Douglas, Dex and Dale. He later became the musical director in the orchestra pit. Also having a nostalgic look round is the man who earned the title of King of the Tivoli in the 1950s with his record-breaking summer shows, Jack Milroy. The theatre itself, now when I look back, is, it, was the, it was the intimacy of it. You know, when you went out there, you could almost touch all the audience, the circle, the gallery. And in these days, I was Mr. yoo -Hoo. I used to shout yoo -Hoo. That was my famous catch one. And it was yoo -Hoo to the gallery, yoo -Hoo to the circle, yoo -Hoo to the stalls and good evening to the rich people in the Ducats, and that was the boxes, but they were wonderful, wonderful audiences. Oh, great. And it was true variety in those days. Oh, yes, it was a real variety show. There was sketches, double acts, and those big scenes with a lovely, with 10 or 12 girl dancers, and a 10-piece orchestra. Oh, it's a fan. I, I, was, I was in cloud nine coming up here. I couldn't believe it, you know. Uh, but hard work. Oh, it was hard work. You were re rehearsing every day. Uh, for the next week's programme and doing two shows at night. So, but then I'm going back 40 years, so I was a lot younger then, you know. Jenny, here we are sitting in the dress circle of the Aberdeen Tivoli Theatre. When you first started to work here, what was your job? Usherette. Mm. And were usherettes different then from the way they are now? Oh, yes. <laughs> we wore black dresses and white aprons. <laughs> and the where now they sell ice cream, it was all boxes of chocolates. Big trays, big boxes of chocolates. Who were the people who attended the Tivoli Theatre? Who were the audiences? Well, mostly the troller men. When they came in from sea, it was a night out with the family, going for a meal, either before the show or after. Depends which house they came to. <laughs> Two shows a night. From May right through to October. Yes, and rehearsing every day for your next programme and uh, after the show, wonderful times. You, people used to invite us out every night. There was, you, you know, what, being a Glasgow uh, character, I always this great uh, thing that they talk about Aberdeen being mean. You came up, they said, well, oh, they're right mean up in Aberdeen. They were always hospitable people and, and they were so generous. I mean, every night you're out at parties. They were, go here, go there, go there. And you got presents. Pre what? Presents at the end of the run, after your six month stint, it must have taken about half an hour to bring the, the gifts up from the stage. The lady attendants brought them up in trays, tray after. You get boxes of fish, you get table lamps, you get chairs. And you did another hamper to take the stuff back to glass. Handed up from the audience? Yes, this presents from all your regular customers. We used to go down the centre passage with all the presents that was presented to the artists. They got a lot of presents? Oh, yes. Yes. Who did they come from? Most of the patrons, most of the audience, you know, we used to walk down the centre and go back and get the tray filled again and what kind hand of, them to the band leader. What kind of presents? Oh, different things. It was maybe a tea set, maybe cigarettes, whiskey, anything. And this was just the audience saying thank you to yes, the artists? Yes, just because they enjoyed it or they liked them. You know, they took a liking throughout the season. And you used to hand these to the band leader. That's right, and he handed them up to the comic. Were the usherettes able to actually watch the shows themselves? When we were finished after the interval, after we did our selling and paid in the money and that, then we could go and sit at our various seats at the, the sides there and you could see the show. You had special seats? Yes, I see them from here. It's a beautiful theatre. Yes. Where did you stage at when you came to play at the Tivoli in Aberdeen? Oh, well, we had wonderful digs. 
wonderful digs. The beautiful theatrical digs in the back wind. And <laughs> one of the nicest, I'll, I'll dedicate this program to her, she's Nanny Martin. She had all the stars staying there, but it was a very old fashioned house. The first floor was the stars room, and the next floor up was the penthouse, she called it. And it was in the attic, and of course the roof was on a slope. So you had to walk that to get to your bed. There were six single beds there. She's kept all the stars there. Sydney Divine, they all started there. It was two pound a week for your bed and breakfast. Two pound a week. Well, uh, with me now is uh, Jack Milroy's co-star, both on stage and off, Mary Lee. And one of the Tivoli's very regular attenders for many, many years, Jim Gray. Yeah. Mary, um, you and Jack took Aberdeen by storm with your summer shows in the, in the yeah. Tivoli in the early 1950s. The first, the first time we came up was 1951, and we kind of put our toe in the water. But Jack was an immediate success, you know, and it was magic the whole way through. And we loved every minute of it. Year um, after year. Year after year. We came back the next year, we got married. You got married while said, you were appearing at the time? Aye, the mm. second year, 1952. And uh, it's funny I should remember that, because I've never remembered an, an anniversary in my life. We've I'm remembering got, it today. We've actually got your uh, wedding photograph. Where was that <laughs> taken? The wedding photograph was taken in the Bridge Street, a... Uh, we got the registry office in Bridge Street, and Jack came to his wedding with his tartan bonnet on, <laughs> and they were all shouting, "Go on yourself, Jack! You!" <laughs> he thought he was—I mean, he really <laughs> thought he was doing a show. Now, Jack mentioned the generosity <laughs> of the yeah. Aberdonians uh, oh, that he experienced. Yes. The band leader at the Tivoli helped with your honeymoon. Is that what was right? his name again? Uh, Cliff uh, Jordan. Cliff Jordan. Oh, I should remember that. That was because before Jack Douglas took over his band. That's leader. right. Mm -hmm. Because Jack and I in these days had a lot of talent but very little money. <laughs> because my first wedding ring was look at a flash of it. The first wedding <laughs> ring was three pounds, and mm -hmm. it was bought in the back wind. So <laughs> that was three pounds. You know. Now, so we had no money for a honeymoon, and we didn't go anywhere. So Cliff uh, Jordan had a hotel here. And he gave us three nights there. So that was for nothing. Willie Cummings, who run the show, gave us a party after the show. So we got all we could eat for a shilling. <laughs> we had nothing. Now, you're remembering the 50s with great affection. But I in fact, indeed, yes. you appeared at the Tivoli. No, Jerry. <laughs> years before that. <laughs> Actually, it was 1936. Because Jack said to me before we caught, he said, Mary, did you never play the Tivoli? You know, with Roy Fox's band. I said, not at all. Now, we only played the Glasgow Empire, the Edinburgh Empire. And then I looked the Tivoli book there, the Aberdeen Tivoli. And I see that I did play it. I must have been, what, I'm going to be, ach, maybe 15, about 1936. Don't <coughs> count up the age now. I'm going to be sitting with our calculators. We've got to thank Jim Littlejohn and his uh, lovely little book on Aberdeen <laughs> Tivoli for reminding you of that. That's right. Now, you touched on there your... Um, uh, career with Roy Fox's band in the 30s. With That's right, Jerry. Uh -huh. You were little Mary Lee then, a tender right. 14 years of age when you started. Mm -hmm. I plunked the school, went for an audition, and uh, they were looking really for a mature woman. But uh, they must have liked me. I sang a number called My Kids a Crooner, and I waited till I was 14. They took me away with a chaperone, and there you are. We've got a picture, actually, we of just you have to have a picture by here. the Roy Fox band. Yes. You're in the middle there with, with the tall I'm in Roy the middle, Fox at your and side. And Roy Fox is next to me. Will I talk you through it? Yes, please. And in the back row, there's Denny Dennis. Yes, second from the left. And he's there. second from the left. I took my hand there to see. And there and were other Scots in the band, weren't there? You're right, Jerry. There was Jock Bain and there was Andy McDivitt, because my name was Mary McDivitt. When I was wee. And that's them on the right and hand side. And that's them the on the right row. hand side. And your chaperone's there too. And sh my chaperone, bless her heart, she's dead now, Alice Bullneath and Jack Nathan. Oh. And uh, oh, thousands of them. Familiar But they names. were happy days, oh, very I happy. They were. And now, I never realised I'd played the Tiv. <laughs> I don't remember it. <laughs> but by George, I remember it from the, from you know, the, the Tivoli days. Jim, what are your memories of oh, the Oh, my memories are very good. I really like the Tivoli. When did you start going there? In 1928. 1928. What do you remember about it? Well, the first thing was, was uh, there was 61 painters doing up the Tivoli that, to begin with. The first one I went to go. There was, so uh, your introduction to the Tivoli wasn't as a member of the audience, you were painting the place? Yes, but that was in the, the, the memories. Now what about and the next And the week after was Dave Willis. 
he was in the show. And you went along. You used to go every week, regularly? Every week, my late wife and I went every week to the Tivoli. Always on the same night in the same seats? More or less, yes, more or less. Mm. What do you remember about the place? Well, it was really great. Everything. It was really a, a great theatre. First class. And you really got a good laugh. And the jokes and that was, you know, made you feel... <laughs> now, I mentioned that there were herds of, of elephants on the stage at one point. There was actually a, quite a number of circus acts. At yes, the there was quite a number. And then was, I remember one of the sea lions coming on and sort of... Ow, 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 ow. <laughs> <laughs> and what about Lofty? Oh, yes, well, the Lofty, the Dutch giant, he was eight feet six, you see? He came and walked in the audience, you know. Then he started shaking hands to the people up in the dress circle. He could reach up to the yeah. dress circle and shake hands. Oh, yes. Looks <laughs> what about the orchestra pit? What do you remember about that? Oh, well, the band? it was Mr. Halstead then, in those days, the conductor. He was nice, wax moustache, you know, very smart. And his nice buttonhole. He was really the conductor. And uh, duty he has not always shed nice little bit. <laughs> 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 and you went for many, many years. Yes, yeah, so. Really. And I you have fond memories? Oh, yes. Very good. You know, things happened. You know, it's really very good. Yeah. A lovely theatre still, looking at yes, the, so the pictures yes. of it. It's a pity they couldn't continue. It's a big one now. It's a pity it didn't continue. Well, who knows? The theatre's still there, and perhaps one day we'll see live shows in it once yeah. again. Yes, I hope so. I hope so. Mm -hmm. Now, we've actually got some uh, posters from. Uh, the years gone by at the Tivoli. Um, here's one of Harry Kemp's famous touring show, which went round the Tivoli in uh, 1927. And take a look at uh, that reference on the bottom of that poster, to early doors. Now, that's a, a phrase that's still used in modern parlance, but certainly not with the meaning that it had then. In those days, what it meant was that if you stood in the queue for the balcony or the upper circle, and were prepared to pay threepence or sixpence extra, the attendant would open the door early for you and allow you up first to get your choice of the unbooked seats. And, of course, at the Tivoli, there was no such nonsense. They advertised no early doors. Top of the bill on uh, this poster is Flory Ford. A sad memory, this, because it was that week in Aberdeen when Flory Ford was attending, was uh, performing at the Tivoli and doing charity concerts for the troops at King's Heat Hospital, which was a military hospital at the time, that she took ill and died. She did her charity performance at King's Seat, came into the Tivoli for her evening performance and wasn't able to take part on the Wednesday night, the end of an era when uh, Flory Ford, a music, holidays, uh, music hall star, ended her career at the Tivoli in Aberdeen. Well, that uh, brings us to the end of this edition of the programme. The next time we remember the way it was, it's with a peony on, armed with a duster, and suffering from dishpan hands. <laughs> Until then, goodbye. And yes, indeed, the way it was is back at the same time next week on Grampian with Look at Housekeeping. Over on Channel 4, the black bag looks into the increasing unrest on the streets of Brooklyn in a couple of minutes. While here on Grambian, an appearance in court doesn't go according to plan for WPC data after the break. There's an old age problem in the upper hand tonight on ITV. Ah! I'm not old! Appearances can sometimes be very deceptive. Meet the new look, Caroline. A sight for sore eyes. Do we still have time for some coffee? Wow. Mommy, your skirt shrunk. The Upper Hand, tonight at 8.30. Have a Starling Christmas. Just look for the no waiting tags. Immediate furniture delivery from Starling. Christmas won't wait, so why should you? Concentrated Persil Liquid is so concentrated...